Uh, so welcome everybody to the first episode of Live Query Tank Talks. So this is sort of a new series we've started. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's a spinoff of what we used to do with our live Q and A's, where we're getting a lot of your questions, categorizing them, putting them into buckets, and then putting them into presentations that we can provide to you guys, um, the audience, as uh, you know, sources of information. Uh, and today's uh, one, we're actually starting with um, fish nutrition, which Dr. Nick has put together uh, this information here for us today. So thank you, Dr. Nick, for joining us. And thank you for taking the time to go over this information for everybody with everybody. Uh, I think, yeah, this is going to be good. Yeah, thank you, Ian. So we have looked at the questions that you've asked in the previous question and answer sessions, and a lot of them were about feeding fish and fish nutrition. So I thought we'd start off with that one to just give you an overview of what ornamental aquarium fish require when they eat. Uh, this is not specifically for food fish or wild fish, but for aquarium fish. But the nutritional part covers all species of fish. So I'm going to switch the slide now. Um, and uh, there's a lot of options available when you're feeding fish. You can buy flake food, slide now. pelleted um, food, wafers, sinking food, floating food, frozen, uh, fresh, freeze dried. And there's a lot of choices out there. So how do you know what does the fish need to eat and what, what should you buy? So uh, the first thing to remember if fish are cold blooded, poikilothermic, which means that their metabolism is affected by the water temperature in which they live. Most of the fish we deal with are warm water, tropical aquarium fish, so they should be in a temperature range of 70 to 78 degrees. Some might uh, prefer uh, even an 80 or 82 degrees, bettas, discus, and some, some uh, of those other fish, whereas some fish like uh, koi and goldfish actually prefer about 65 to 68 degrees. But for most of us, if you keep your aquarium in the, in the 70 degrees, it should be pretty good for most of the fish, and that will give them the metabolism they need to properly uh, eat and digest their food. And then like all animals, fish need protein, fat, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals from their water, from, from their food. Uh, as, as land dwelling animals, we also need water. Fish, because they live in the water, is not something that we need to, to give them as part of their diet, but we do need to make sure they have a good quality water. So the first component we'll talk about is protein. Protein makes up the majority of the food or the majority of the ingredients in the food. So if you think about fish in the wild, they're mostly eating snails, invertebrates, uh, dead animals, dead fish, or if they're carnivorous ones, they're eating other live fish or uh, insects. And even uh, the fish that are, you know, we think of as herbivores or algae eaters also will eat animal protein as well as algae and other plants. So the majority of the components in their diet in the wild is actually protein. When we think about our diets as humans, protein is a smaller component of our diet and uh, carbohydrates are the main component. But in fish, the protein is the main part of the diet. It's also the most expensive ingredient. So that's why fish foods that have higher quality protein will tend to cost more than fish, that, fish foods that use a, a lesser costly protein source. Um, the protein is broken down into amino acids. Amino acids are resynthesized into what the, what the body needs and then will be recreated as proteins inside the fish's body. Uh, and uh, these amino acids, there's about 20 of them total, but of those, 10 or so of them can be recreated from other amino acids, whereas 10 amino acids must be re uh, incorporated into the diet. And so if you're using a fish food that has maybe a, one specific type of protein, let's say a, some, some grain protein in it, it may not have the complete balance of amino acids that the fish require, which is why most good quality fish foods will have an animal source of protein in addition to plant sources. And usually it'll be in the form of fish meal because of course fish meal protein has the protein made from fish, which would mean that the fish that are eating that would get the amino acids that they need. Uh, and protein is used for growth and reproduction, 
But if they don't have enough other sources of energy, protein will be used as a source of energy. And when we think about the ammonia in our aquarium water, we know that ammonia is the waste the fish produce and ammonia is toxic. That ammonia, the nitrogen from the ammonia, comes from the protein in the diet. So if we feed fish a real high protein diet, more protein than they actually need, that extra protein can produce extra ammonia, and that can cause an ammonia increase of the water. So you have to keep that in mind as well. And that's why overfeeding contributes to nitrogenous wastes, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. And so that we don't want to overfeed our fish. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The second component is fats. And we typically think of fats and oils. Uh, fats and oils together are lipids. Fats are solid at room temperature, oils are liquid. And uh, so the fish do get a lot of fat in the food they eat in the wild. And young fish will use fat to help them grow and they use it as energy so that they can save the protein for growth. If they don't have enough fat, they'll start breaking down protein for, that they would typically use for growth and they have to use it for energy. So fish that uh, don't get enough fat in their diet, young fish, they don't grow as well. And that's one of the reasons you might see some fish just don't seem to be growing as well as others. They may not be getting as much fat in their diet to use as energy. And fats are efficient sources of energy. They create nine kilocalories per gram, whereas protein and carbohydrates only produce four kilocalories per gram. So for every gram of fat that's consumed, they get two and a quarter times more calories, more energy with fat than they do from either proteins or carbohydrates. And the fat breaks down into carbon dioxide and water. So there's really no waste product like the nitrogenous ammonia that can be produced from excess protein. But if we overfeed the fish and they're getting too much fat in the diet, that fat gets deposited in the body. The fish will get fat. I've seen a lot of koi that are overweight and you see, see very fat koi because they get fed too much food. And you know the koi are very voracious eaters. They'll eat anything mm. they can find. And so we will see fat fish, but that fat can also build up the liver and lead to uh, what's called hepatic lipidosis or fatty liver degeneration. So you don't want to overfeed your fish either. Uh, and then in addition to fat, which we think of fat fat, there's also essential fatty acids like linoleic, linolenic acid. These are the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids that are actually necessary for metabolism, for cell structure, for uh, enzymatic activities in the body. So even if the fish has sufficient fat in the diet for energy, if it's not getting the specific fatty acids, it can lead to uh, tissue erosion and other uh, uh, metabolic problems. So when we look at a diet, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, looking at the label, we want to ensure that the diet actually has the correct fatty acids involved included as well. Uh, here's an interesting thing. This is a koi and it has what's called Sakoke disease, which is if you have too much fat in the food or even a correct amount of fat, but the food is not stored properly. So a uh, very typical koi hobbyist thing would be have a, a bag or a bucket of koi food and you leave it out by the pond. So it's readily available to feed the fish, but it's exposed to sunlight, it's exposed to air, it's exposed to humidity, and that food can turn rancid where the fats start to, to break down and the rancid fat will utilize vitamin E out of the fish's body and the lack of vitamin E then creates this muscle wasting disease that we see in some koi. And it could happen to any fish, but it's, it's primarily seen in koi with, that are fed a pelleted diet that's gone rancid. So this is just a one metabolic disease associated with diet and specifically with fats that we want to you know, make you aware of the proper food storage, keeping it in an airtight container, keeping it preferably at room temperature or refrigerated. If you have a large amount of food that's gonna take you more than let's say a month to use up, 
put some of it in a container, you know, by your aquarium or by your pond where it uh, will, will not get too hot and not get exposed to air, but keep the remainder in a refrigerator or even a freezer, which will keep it fresher longer and, and keep the food uh, healthier to, for when you use it. Okay, the next <clears throat> part of the diet is carbohydrates. Now, we as humans eat a lot of carbohydrates. So all of the grain we eat is primarily carbohydrates. So corn, wheat, rice, uh, the, the soybean, beans, those all may have some protein in it, but they're predominantly carbohydrates. And also the sugar we eat is a carbohydrate. Fish, by comparison, eat much less carbohydrate than land animals do people. And they really get very little simple sugar in the aquatic environment because simple sugars would dissolve in the water. So if you think about, hey, I'm going to feed my fish a teaspoon of sugar, as soon as you put that sugar in the aquarium, it's going to dissolve and it's floating around in the water. But it's really not available to the fish at that point. So the carbohydrates they get in their diet uh, are higher, of course, in, om in uh, omnivores and herbivores than in strict carnivores, but it's really not a lot of carbohydrate uh, compared to land animals. And the carbohydrates that they eat are less digestible, so they're usually more lignans and cellulose and, uh, you know, if they're eating uh, plant matter, it's not going to be a highly digestible carbohydrate. But there is the fiber component, component of, of carbohydrates. And fiber is carbohydrate that does not get digested. And carbohydrates for fiber are important in keeping uh, the intestinal tract moving properly and pushing the food through the intestines and forming fecal material. So if there's too few or too little carbohydrates and especially uh, fibers, carbohydrates that can cause stool problems uh, where the fish can't digest and pass the stool out properly. Um, now the excess carbohydrates can be converted into sugars which are stored or glycogen, glucose, which can be stored in the liver. And if there's just like we talked about too much fat in the diet, if there's too much carbohydrate in the diet, that can also lead to liver storage disease, uh, including fatty liver disease. So we're gonna talk about percentage of all of these uh, components in the diet uh, shortly. And then next, of course, we need vitamins and minerals. So the vitamins include all of the B complex and the C vitamins like we think about we need. Uh, there are very few animals that actually require vitamin C. Most animals produce it on their own. Guinea pigs require vitamin C. Primates like humans require vitamin C. And surprisingly, fish require vitamin C. Uh, and they usually get plenty of that from the food they eat, however. And then they also need the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, which uh, are stored in the fat. And they can be stored in the liver or in the, in the fatty parts of the body, whereas water-soluble vitamins are utilized throughout the body, not stored in the body, so they need to be consumed on a regular basis. When we don't get enough vitamins, we'll see the fish will have decreased appetite, poor growth, hemorrhaging either in the skin or internal organs uh, with a deficiency of vitamin C. We see spinal deformities because vitamin C is important for cartilage formation, including the intervertebral discs between the, the bones of the spine. Uh, and we already talked about Sokoke disease, which is a vitamin E deficiency. It can be caused both by just not enough vitamin E in the diet or feeding a diet containing rancid fat, which consumes the vitamin E and uses it up. So I think this next slide uh, is talking specifically about vitamin C, where uh, we don't really think about it as a component necessary in the fish food, but it is. And vitamin C has a very short shelf life. So ascorbic acid, which is the typical form of vitamin C, will last in a prepared food for maybe three or six months. And if you keep it in an airtight container, and especially at a refrigerated temperature, it might keep longer than that. But if you think about your container of fish food, I'm going to open up the food, take off the seal off the top, which makes it airtight. Now it's exposed to air. Now I'm going to leave it out on the counter. And if I don't use that food up maybe in a month or, or 
you know, a couple months at least, the vitamin C content is going to break down and be diminished. So you do want to make sure you keep the food airtight, cooler, avoid heat, avoid sunlight, avoid air, and try to use it as quickly as possible like we already talked about. Now, some of the newer foods are using L-ascorbyl-2 polyphosphate. That's a magic thing. That's not ascorbic acid. It is a form of vitamin C ascorbic acid that's been phosphorylated, which makes it have a longer shelf life. And I've seen it have uh, reported maybe up to two years. Um, mm -hmm. I would probably not want to be feeding two-year-old fish food. But, you know, if, if it lasts longer, you have to think about when the food was manufactured, when it was through the wholesaler, the retail store, and now I bought it and I'm going to feed it to my fish. It could be six months old. It could be maybe older than that before you're actually buying it. So if you look on the label, it'll tell you it has a phosphorylated ascorbic acid or ascorbyl 2 polyphosphate, something like that. It will tell you that it has a form of vitamin C that is will last longer in the food and won't go bad as quickly. And so that's a, that's a benefit to have as well. Now, for koi hobbyists, we know a lot of them will actually feed their fish vegetables. And if you have, you know, placostomus or some other herbivorous fish, herbivorous uh, baboonus cichlids, things like that, you may be using some vegetables in your food uh, to feed the fish anyway. So feeding, um, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts probably aren't as good unless you shred them a little bit. Cabbage, you could shred. Uh, cauliflower, those type of things do have vitamin C and will help prevent vitamin C deficiency, especially in young growing fish. You may see fish, sometimes you look at the fish store or maybe in your own aquarium and you'll see fish that you've raised that are have gill plates that aren't fully formed or are curled or have deficiencies to the gill plate. That was probably due to a vitamin C deficiency while the fish was forming when it was very young. And so we do see some uh, bony deficiencies that occur in a vitamin C deficiency uh, in young fish that don't get enough vitamin C. For koi hobbyists, some of them will take a, a whole grapefruit or an orange, slice it in half or into quarters, throw it in the pond. It'll float on the surface of the pond and the koi will come up and eat the fruity part out of the rind. And that's a good way of giving your koi extra vitamin C in the summer, maybe. Um, there, I think, okay, then here's some minerals. Uh, this minerals are also required in the food, calcium chloride, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and sulfur. But we think about fish, they live in an aquatic environment and minerals, many minerals will dissolve in the water. So for most fish, calcium, chloride, phosphorus, sodium, are not a problem because they can absorb it directly from the water. And there's plenty of that in seawater for sure and most hard freshwater. Now, maybe you're breeding discus and you've got discus in, in very low alkaline, very low hardness water. Okay, so now there's a lesser amount of these minerals in the water. So it would be very important in, in fish that live in soft water to get these minerals in their diet. But most commercially prepared foods have plenty of minerals added to them because minerals are comparatively less expensive, and so they're usually added in um, adequate quantities of prepared fish foods. And uh, deficiency of minerals can cause poor growth, loss of appetite, which is anorexia, anemia, that you know, iron is necessary for blood cell formation. So if you're lacking iron in the diet, uh, the fish can get anemia. Cataracts, where they get the white lenses to the eyes, can be associated with both of uh, vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies. And of course, if they don't get enough, especially in a young growing fish that's trying to build bone and, and build organs, but there's a calcium deficiency or uh, any kind of uh, mineral deficiency, it, it could essentially just die. Um, and many of these are absorbed directly through the gills. So that's why freshwater fish and saltwater fish get plenty of calcium, plenty of phosphorus, plenty of magnesium in the water unless it's RO water or very um, poor mineral content water. So uh, the rest will need to be added to the diet. So this is an interesting x-ray of a koi, um, and I just put this in to show you what 
the inside of a fish looks like. Um, so here you can see the two dark shadows at the top are the gas bladder, and cyprinid fish have a two-chambered gas bladder, so there's a front lobe and a back lobe to the gas bladder. Other fish might only have a one-chambered gas bladder. Some fish have no gas bladder. Uh, but below that, you see the intestinal tract. Now, the, the reason the intestines show up so well in this x-ray is because this fish actually has uh, is getting a barium series. And I, I added barium through a feeding tube into the fish's intestines and then took this picture. So you're looking at the barium, which is a mineral that shows up on x-rays. So you can see the intestinal tract. Now, the interesting thing about this is koi are omnivores, you know, more herbivores, omnivores, and they have a very long intestinal tract. And you see the intestine winds back and forth through that uh, seven different times it, it bends and, and goes back and forth. If you have a fish that's a predator like a bass that's used to eating other live fish or smaller fish or, um, you know, insects, they have a very short intestinal tract because they're eating a uh, food that is very dense in protein and it, the intestines will stretch widely to be able to take in a lot of food uh, at one time and then it'll absorb that food and so there's a difference between carnivorous fish and herbivorous fish in the length of the intestinal tract the other interesting thing about this fish is you really don't see a stomach there's there's you know at the very very beginning uh, on the top to um, I guess would be the left side towards the head, there is a little bit wider area, and that's still intestines. And um, the, the, a lot of the cyprinids, koi, goldfish, they actually don't have a stomach because they've evolved to graze continuously. So they're constantly eating food throughout the day, just anything they can find they're nibbling on. So they're getting little bits of food added in over a long period of time, and they, did, they didn't need a stomach to hold a bunch of food. Carnivorous fish will have a stomach that will stretch and they can eat a whole fish and swallow it at once and let it sit in the stomach. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm feeding my koi or goldfish and I'm feeding them a large meal once a day, they're really not designed to eat that way. They're designed to eat a little bit at a time and they don't have a stomach. Fortunately, the intestines do stretch, so if they eat a lot of food at once, it'll fill up the intestinal tract, the anterior portion of the intestines, and, and that will stretch out. But if you know what the fish eats and, and how its digestive anatomy is set up, we can take care of them better by feeding her, herbivorous fish uh, maybe smaller meals several times a day. And a carnivorous fish, you know, there are some carnivorous feed, fish that you, eat, you feed once a week. Uh, and they eat, you know, a uh, goldfish or a feeder fish or some other type of food, a pelleted diet. And you might only feed them once a week or twice a week or every other day because they don't, they'll eat a lot at one time and they don't necessarily need to eat every day. So again, knowing what your fish eats, eats in the wild or how its digestive works will help us determine how we should best feed them. So we've talked a lot about all of these ingredients and, and what's, goes into the food. So now I'm at the store and I'm going to buy food. I just uh, picked a, this is a little food at random here. And I said, I bought this can of food. I'm going to look at what it says on the back. So the first thing you want to look at is the guaranteed analysis. And this tells you all of those ingredients, protein, fat, carbohydrate, if, uh, you know, minerals, things like that. It tells you what's in it. Um, and so this particular one, the guaranteed analysis says minimum crude protein. 29.5%. Now it does say minimum, which means it could have 40% protein in that food. It would still meet the guaranteed analysis because it's the minimum amount. Um, but we did talk about protein being the most expensive ingredient. So chances are this particular food probably has 30, 35% protein in it and, and probably not much more than that, or they would have put it on the label. So how much protein does a fish need? Well, uh, one of the things I see, and I, I work yet a lot with aquariums, I'm actually at an aquarium today, and uh, one of the things they see in aquariums is we have a lot of old fish swimming around in tanks that get too fat because the food that we buy at the market, especially if you're feeding like a trout chow uh, or a catfish chow, which is a, you know, comes in big bags and it's made for the farmers to feed their baby mm. fish. And you, you buy a bag of trout chow to feed even trout here at an aquarium, 
and it's got 45% protein in it because the food was designed to feed baby fish, to grow them big fast. Now we have these old big fish swimming around in an aquarium and they're eating this 45% protein and they're getting fat, they're getting uh, you know, fatty liver disease or just getting overweight or other problems. So young fish need to have a higher protein level. Older fish should probably go to a food with a lower protein level so they're just not overeating protein. So that's something to think about. Uh, the minimum crude fat, we know this one, 3.5%, that's pretty low. That's the minimum, but it's still pretty low for the amount of fat that's normally in a diet. It could be up to 10 or even 15%. So we talked about fat being important for baby fish. So if this uh, food was fed to young growing fish, that would not be as good. But if this is fed to an older fish, this is probably better. It's lower protein, lower fat, that's great. But for a baby fish, that's not enough protein, it's not enough fat. So a lot of times you wanna look and see if the food even says, you know, suitable for fry or suitable for growing fish. Uh, maximum crude fiber, notice this one is maximum while the others were minimum. So this only has 2% fiber, which isn't bad, but typically fiber might be up to 5%. And then moisture, uh, moisture is important because the higher the moisture content, the faster the food can go rancid or get moldy. So you don't want food that has high moisture unless you're gonna freeze it or refrigerate. If it's gonna be out at room temperature, you want it to have a moisture content less than 10%. This one had 7%, so that's okay. And then minimum phosphorus, and that, that's uh, one per, one, it should say 1%, I think I'm having trouble reading. It looked like 10% at first, which would be way high for phosphorus, but it should be 1%, minimum 1%, so that's okay. And yeah, then also 100%. notice, okay, it also says minimum ascorbic acid, vitamin C, 100 um, milligrams per kilogram, so that's okay. Now we'll look at the ingredients list on here, and the ingredients is listed in order of highest concentration. So when I see this food, the number one in component in making this food is wheat, wheat starch, then ground brown rice, and then corn flour. So I'm looking at this food and I say, well, this is an okay food, especially for older fish and maybe herbivorous fish, since the majority of the ingredients are wheat, rice, and corn. And then we get to the fish meal is the fourth ingredient. But then we go back to oatmeal and soybean meal and then finally, beef crackling and pork crackling, you know, whatever those are, dried, dried skins, and then a wheat germ meal, algae meal. So I'm, when I look at this food, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a bad food because there's a lot of research recently for food fish farmers that shows that using vegetable-based protein, so corn, wheat, ground, they have a lower percentage of protein in that component, but the protein in them itself is acceptable for fish, and they've done studies and showed that um, vegetable protein works just as well for fish. It's just a matter of balancing it. So just because the fish meal is down to the fourth ingredient doesn't mean this is not a good food, but you have to be aware of what you're feeding it to. And probably this particular one, and I don't mean to pick on this, I'm just using this as an example. This particular food would not be appropriate for young fish or carnivorous fish. Hmm. Okay, so let's go on real briefly. Here's a couple more, and I won't spend as much time on these. But you notice this one is a minimum crude protein, 32%. So that's a little higher. Minimum crude fat, 3%. Maximum crude fiber, 3%. All of those are okay. Maximum moisture, 9%. And then it notices it says supplemented with the vitamins and the minerals and all that. So that's what you want to see. So again, these are just examples, and I'm not going to spend any time uh, going through these. I just want you to be aware when you're looking at food, read the guaranteed analysis and read the ingredients panel. And if you're feeding um, carnivorous cichlids, for example, you want uh, protein to be fish meal, shrimp, squid, insects. Insects are getting to be a big, big thing in, in all kinds of animal feed. Insect meal can be grown much more efficiently with much less water, much less land, much less energy. Uh, someday we will all be eating insect meal in our food. Right now it's getting to be in uh, dog food, cat food, not so much cat food, dog food and uh, uh, cattle 
food and fish food, and there's a lot of fish foods now that are coming out with uh, uh, insect meal. And insect meal is definitely uh, the, the way to go in the future because it's a lot more sustainable than fish meal, which is mostly you know captured in the wild and uh, the stocks are getting depleted. So that's something to look for. But just pay attention to those labels. So what should we have? Well, here's just a real briefly an uh, ideal diet uh, containing protein 30 to 45 percent. That would be for young growing fish. If you had an older fish, maybe a, you know, like a, you've got a display aquarium, it's got an Oscar in it. That Oscar is 10 or 15 years old, which is not unusual for Oscars. You probably don't need a high protein diet, even though it's a carnivore. You might look for one that's, that's you know, 25 to 30 percent protein. Whereas a young growing fish, you got you know koi in your pond, and you want them to get three feet long, which they can do. You'll want a higher protein in the diet to allow the body to build muscle mass and, and grow bigger. Uh, fat, you want to have the the omega fatty acids. 1% omega negative 3 and 1% and omega minus 5, uh, 6 rather, and then the total amount of fat, 5 to 15%. Now we saw some of those labels only had minimum of 3%, but probably had more like 5% in them. Uh, young fish, you want the higher percentage of fat. Older fish, go for the lower percentage. And nitrogen-free extracts is the digestible carbohydrates. A lot of times that won't even be on the label, but you can calculate it just by adding everything up and see what's missing. What's missing is going to be the nitrogen-free extract, which is basically soluble carbohydrates, and which are the least important part of a fish diet. And then fiber, somewhere between 3 and 8%. And um, you don't want it to be too high because now you're, you're basically going in one end and out the other, right? They're not absorbing the fiber. But a little bit of fiber is necessary to maintain digestive function, the digestive health in the intestines. And then ash is the mineral content. So what they do is they do all these tests on it, and all the minerals at the end are just the ash. And that'll be calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, and all the minor ingredients. Uh, a typical diet is going to have, you know, maybe 1% calcium, 1% sodium, um, a smaller percentage of the other minerals. But the total will add up uh, maybe as much as 10% is, is typical you might see on there. And you, you may or may not see that listed on the, uh, the guaranteed analysis, or you might only see some of the minerals listed, but not all of them. And the vitamin mix is usually not listed, but typically needs to be about 1% of the diet should be just the vitamins. And then the moisture in the food, if it's a dry food, flake food or pelleted food, it'll be about 8 to 10% maximum. If it gets higher than that, the fish food will not last long. If it's a frozen food, you'll probably see there's about 70% water in a frozen food, uh, maybe even higher percentage of that. So you're paying a lot for the water, but what you're getting dissolved in that water or in the water is a very nutritious food because freezing preserves the food really well. So frozen blood worms, frozen tube effects worms, uh, frozen brine shrimp, they're still very nutritious. Um, and then, you know, when you add all that together, it might be 100 percent, but you may not see 100 percent when you add everything up on the label. So you have to guess or calculate what, what's missing. The total energy for fish, about 330 kilocalories per 100 grams of food. If it's too low, that means you have to feed a lot more food for the fish to get the nutrition. If it's too high, you'll probably waste food by feeding too much, or you may be helping to contribute to wastes in the tank by overfeeding. Whew. So that's a lot of fish nutrition. We're going to sum it up here about how do we best take care of our fish? So, of course, provide a stress-free environment, which means compatible fish, the proper hiding places, the proper size, you know, don't overcrowd them. Make sure you're feeding a nutritionally balanced diet. So what does that mean? We talked about nutrition, but what does it mean to balance it? Use a, a good prepared food, so dry food, flake food, pelleted food, on pretty much a daily basis with frozen, freeze-dried, or fresh foods supplemented, uh, maybe not every day, but maybe once or twice a week, so they're getting some variety. And even with your prepared food, like maybe a flake food and a pelleted food, and, and alternating them. 
so that you know that they're not eating the same food every day because the chance of nutritional deficiency will increase if you're doing that. Maintain proper water quality because we know no matter how good we're taking care of the fish and feeding them properly and keeping them disease free, if we let ammonia, nitrite, nitrate go up, pH go too low, um, phosphorus, phosphorus get too high, wh whatever that is, if we're not maintaining good water quality, that's going to be detrimental to the fish. Don't overcrowd them, don't overfeed them, take a look at them every day to make sure when they're eating, everybody's coming up to eat, that nobody's hiding, nobody's sick, nobody's you know avoiding uh, coming out to eat. If you have nocturnal feeders, you have to be aware they eat differently than daytime feeders would. Uh, if you, you know, Placosomus might come out more at night or might spend a lot of time eating algae, but there's probably not enough algae to, to feed a Placosomus. So you should be thinking about using algae wafers or other things like that to keep them healthy. Uh, and last, I'm not going to talk about this, but just, you know, we mentioned water quality is really important. So pay attention to your water quality. Uh, salt water, water quality might be different from freshwater. Uh, pond fish or different kinds of fish might have different requirements. But in general, you don't, you don't want any ammonia, no nitrite. Keep the nitrate low. Make sure there's plenty of oxygen. Make sure your mineral balance with the hardness and alkalinity and pH and salinity are all okay. And avoid chlorine. Chlorine will kill your fish like it's in the tap water. So you make sure you get rid of that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we went a little bit over, but I think we got a lot of great information today. Dr. Nick, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, and uh, hopefully everybody who stayed tuned uh, through the whole thing learned something new. I know I certainly did. Um, especially some of those earlier points about vitamin C and the deficiencies and the, the intestinal tract one was quite interesting too, to see the, the, the x-ray with the barium, um, the barium, uh, coming through the x-ray. So that was really cool. So, um, anyway, uh, to put a kind of cap on this one, thank you everybody for joining us. This is the first tank talk that we've done. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks actually with our next one. Uh, and we'll be working on a new, topic for then. So stay tuned. We'll be announcing that on Facebook for our next live event. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we welcome any feedback, any questions you may have too. And um, thank you most of all, Dr. Nick, for your time and your expertise. Thank you. It's a joy being with you all. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your week and a Merry Christmas. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye now. Bye-bye.